Pennsylvania Turnpike I love you so All the way from Jersey To Ohio Oh, how I go For the beautiful mountains And the fields of grass And the friendly road stands Where we can get gas Pennsylvania Turnpike How I love you And when I pay my toll fare Don't you love me too? Now I'm up in Somerset And the snow plow ain't come yet Pennsylvania Turnpike I'm stuck on you For 300 years, the eastern half of Pennsylvania was divided from the western half by a rugged chain of mountains called the Appalachians. This mountainous barrier proved a challenge to travelers and traders alike. But by the middle of the 20th century, Pennsylvania roadmasters found a way to level those mountains. They built a superhighway over and through the Appalachians and finally connected the East and the West. The road was called the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The idea for the Pennsylvania Turnpike began to take shape in the 1930s, in the middle of the Depression. It was a tough time for this country. Many people were out of work. To lift the country out of the Depression, the federal government created relief agencies to give people jobs and provide money for public works projects. Pennsylvania legislators promptly began to look for a suitable state project. They came up with a plan to build a major new highway between Middlesex in Cumberland County and Irwin in Westmoreland County that followed an abandoned railroad right-of-way. The project was approved by engineers who surveyed the terrain. And two years later, a bill calling for construction of the road came to a vote. The legislature added just one clause before the bill passed. No state funds could ever be used to construct or maintain the highway. On May 21, 1937, Governor George Earle signed Act 211, creating the Pennsylvania Turnpike Commission which had the authority to construct, finance, operate, and maintain toll highways. The commission got to work right away, planning America's first superhighway. But they quickly hit a snag with funding. No one could agree how the project would be financed. Ultimately, the commission worked out an arrangement with the federal government to pay for the project through bonds at a $20 million grant. But there was a stipulation. The highway had to be finished by June 1940. By the time the financial wrangling was completed, it was already October 1938. Two weeks later, officials broke ground on a farm in Cumberland County. Present were turnpike commissioners and federal government representatives, along with hundreds of spectators. One woman stood out from the rest. Her name was Mrs. Eberly, wife of the farmer who owned the land. She attended the ceremony with her five young children and collected autographs from the officials. She was a smart lady. She had a vision that this was going to be something very historical that happened, and as it turned out, it was. I was only a nine-year-old kid, but I knew it was something important because all these men dressed in suits, then when they wanted to take our picture, I thought, well, this really must be something very, very special. 15,000 men and women went to work on the new highway in the spring of 1939. They worked from sunup to sundown, week in and week out. They couldn't afford to take a single day off. This enormous army of road builders had to construct 160 miles of a four-lane all-concrete highway seven two-lane tunnels, 11 interchanges with toll booths, and 10 service plazas, all in 20 months' time. The public was fascinated by this massive undertaking. Stories appeared everywhere, from life to scientific America. 
In August of 1940, with the highway nearly complete, Turnpike Commission Chairman Walter Jones organized a two-day motorcade tour for public officials. The tour sparked increased excitement across the state. Everyone wanted to know, when would the turnpike open? Construction delays had pushed back the original opening date of July 4th, and no new date had been set. In addition to construction delays, the commission also had to deal with an issue they had put on the back burner. How would they collect tolls? It's hard to imagine now, but back then there weren't any comparable toll roads in existence. At least, not of this size. And the interstate system wasn't to begin until 15 years later. The problem was handed to Lee Rischel, new superintendent of fare collections. He created the renowned ticket-based toll system that's still in use today. In September 1940, he began training the first toll collectors. I would start out in the morning, maybe 6 o'clock, to visit 10 interchanges, or as many as I could during the day, and I'd work, it wouldn't be anything unusual to work till midnight, to make certain that the collectors at the interchange were ready when the commission decided we'd have an opening time and date. Finally, the date was set, midnight, October 1st, 1940. They had conquered the mountains and connected the eastern half of Pennsylvania with the west in less than two years. At midnight on the 1st, crowds gathered at the eastern and western toll booths to celebrate as America's first and only superhighway, the Pennsylvania Turnpike, was opened. I remember most of the fairs were small fairs, you know, like from Irwin or New Stanton or Somerset. People wanted to see this great turnpike they read about in the paper. They read about these tunnels. They wanted to experience going through a tunnel. I remember sitting there with the map in my lap and uh, keeping track of how long it would be till we came to the next one. There was just one row of lights down the middle, and it was kind of like the black hole of Calcutta when you went into these things. A trip on the turnpike remained a special event. Few people had ever seen a highway like it. Men and women who worked on the turnpike felt like they were doing something monumental, something really special. They called it the Dream Highway. Two and a half million people used the turnpike that first year, double the predictions. But little more than a year later, civilian traffic had all but dried up, replaced by military convoys. The U.S. had entered World War II. With gas and tire rationing and a 35 mile per hour fuel conservation restriction, most would-be travelers stayed home. Then, in 1946, with peace declared in Europe and Japan and tire rationing lifted, war-weary motorists eagerly got back behind the wheel. That year, traffic on the turnpike shot back up to first-year levels, and talk quickly turned to expansion. In 1948, work began on turnpike extensions, east to Philadelphia and west to Ohio. On the eastern extension, the biggest challenge was building a bridge over the broad Susquehanna River just south of Harrisburg. In the early 1950s, dozens of states followed Pennsylvania's lead and built their own turnpikes. Then, in 1956, President Eisenhower created the federally funded interstate highway system, and the toll road boom went bust. In Pennsylvania, while some planned highways were folded into the interstate program, the turnpike continued a busy building schedule, completing the western extension to Ohio in 1951, and eastern extensions first to Philadelphia, then to the Delaware River, and northeastern extensions to Scranton by 1957. The driving public was quick to take advantage of the ease of traveling across the state. In 1960, annual traffic volume was calculated at 31 million vehicles. The popularity of the road now introduced a new problem, congestion at the tunnels. In fact, at the westernmost tunnel, Laurel Hill, it was not unusual to see a five-mile backup on summer weekends. 
clearly the restricted access of the two-lane tunnel was no longer tolerable. Over the next decade, the Turnpike Commission invested $100 million in a major building plan to deal with the congestion. First, they built a bypass around Laurel Hill. Then they constructed four-lane tunnels at Allegheny, Tuscarora, Kittatinny, and Blue Mountain, followed by a second bypass around Sidling Hill and Rays Hill tunnels. Despite these million-dollar construction projects, the toll rate for cars remained the same as it had been when the turnpike opened. One cent per mile. But by 1969, inflation prompted the commission to raise the rate to 1.9 cents. The 1970s proved to be a decade devoted more to planning than building. One ambitious plan called for a $1.1 billion eight-lane redo of the Turnpike's original section through the Allegheny Mountains. But the opening of the I-80 interstate reduced traffic, and energy shortages cut into revenue still further as motorists facing long lines at the gas pump chose to keep their cars parked at home. Ultimately, the commission decided to shelve the plan. By the 1980s, the oil supply began flowing again, and traffic picked up on the turnpike. This was a time of big changes. Fast food chains replaced the old familiar Howard Johnson restaurants. Toll collection became computerized, and traveler aid call boxes appeared in mile increments by the side of the highway. But the biggest change at the turnpike occurred with the passing of new legislation in 1985. It was called Act 61, the Turnpike Organization and Toll Road Conversion Act. This act authorized the Turnpike Commission to construct new highway projects and operate them as toll roads. Act 61 set the stage for major expansions on the turnpike and, in time, a total rebuilding of the original superhighway. A few of the building projects completed in the 1990s include the 17-lane Mid-County Interchange near the Norristown Interchange, the Beaver Valley Expressway, and the Greensburg Bypass. Construction also began on the Monfayette, West Virginia to Uniontown Expressway, and the Route 70 to Route 51 transportation project. At the same time, motorists noticed big changes at the service plazas. Exxon gas pumps, a long familiar sight to turnpike travelers, disappeared as other gas companies took over. And service expanded to include ATMs and informational lodging boards. During this time, the Commission wanted to create a way for drivers to travel the highway without having to stop at a toll booth. The system they adopted used a radio antenna to read a transmitter tag on the car's windshield. Then, a computer calculated the fare, and it was deducted from the driver's account. The new system, we now call EasyPass, was launched on December 2, 2000. It was an exciting start to the new decade. Since then, a primary focus at the Turnpike has been the complete rebuilding of the old highway from the ground up. The Susquehanna River Bridge, built near the Turnpike headquarters, was one of the projects of this new building era. When the old river bridges proved too expensive to refurbish, a new six-lane bridge replaced them. On the roadway itself, so far, more than 72 miles have been rebuilt and widened to include three lanes in both directions. The new construction approach uses innovative techniques and materials to make the road safer and reduce traffic tie-ups. Along with the turnpike rebuild, all of the service plazas are being torn down and rebuilt. The Oakmont Plum Plaza reopened in 2007. Since then, new plazas have been constructed at Sidling Hill, Allentown, North Somerset, King of Prussia, and Hickory Run. And the renovations will continue until all 17 plazas are rebuilt. Today, 188 million vehicles travel on the turnpike every year. And the toll road sees more traffic in the average work week than it did in its entire opening year. In 2010, the historic roadway reached another milestone, its 70th anniversary. 
It's been 70 years since the highway opened to the cheering public. 70 years since travelers realized the dream of crossing the state on an unrestricted stretch of road. 70 years since the Pennsylvania Turnpike became America's first superhighway. Mark the beginning of the nation's first superhighway, the Pennsylvania Turnpike. The road ahead curves, gliding smoothly through mountains, across valleys, over bridges. Leading to destinations, memories, work trips, day trips, weekend getaways, Sunday drives, Friday rambles. Solid. Reliable, convenient. Cars, buses, trucks, all are welcome. Seasons change, bringing weather and wonder. Daytime turns to night, then back again. Fresh air blows Pennsylvania breezes. Travelers rest and refresh. The pavement is firm steering toward the journey's end. Is that where you're going? Yes, I'm... What's that? Oh, that's the entrance to the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Haven't you ever been over it? Easy on, easy travel, easy off. Sunset, twilight, or dawn. You're never alone on the Turnpike. To ensure the safety of our children, to ensure the safety of our motorists and support the economy of Pennsylvania. Driving forward, technology enlightens. A past of pride, a presence of vision, a future of innovation. Leading, moving, merging, evolving. These will be the first phase, if you will, in the Commonwealth of moving our interstate system to 70 miles an hour. Adapting. What are we going to do when we hit the real mountains? Well, you'll see any minute now. We tunnel right through. Right. This is a dream, by the way. Fueling progress. Branching outward. Moving forward. I'm going to four lanes to six lanes in this section of roadway. This is the Pennsylvania Turnpike. 75 years.